Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops, with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops, for psychological operations, is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. The second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feels. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Welcome to the 285th consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, buried so deep in the ice cold snow. That is Snowmaha here. Really, really distraught about having to dig that shit out in the morning. And all the way across the white blanketed city of Omaha is my co host, Matt! I'm broadcasting from inside a fucking Tauntaun. What he's not telling you people is he actually gained the weight, so he has his own Tauntaun. Yeah, I am the Tauntaun. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag the Tauntaun is I. <laughs> yeah, I am definitely the Tauntaun here. But yeah, I would cut myself open to live inside me if I was anybody else. I mean, yeah, just to steal a bit from the radio host out here uh, in the Omaha area who are also buried in snow, <laughs> just like us. Yeah. If you're looking around the room and you're not sure which one of your friends is the Tauntaun, <laughs> it might be you. You are. De- yeah, yeah, it is you. You're definitely the Tauntaun. <laughs> now, I am very lucky. I have some uh, some some larger friends and we could all be looking at each other going, well, <laughs> I guess guess any one of us could be the Tauntaun at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, now we're, for- we're, we're, di- we're digging deep into fat shaming, and I, I'm feeling really bad about this bit, and I want to back out and eject, but I'm not going to delete it because that's just us. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, when we, if when we were we- doing it to other people, it'd yeah. be bad, but it- we're <laughs> doing it to ourselves. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, you can make the joke about yourself, but now we're starting to like, you know, compare which one of our friends and we're in territory where I feel like I'm going to start cutting somebody down on air and leave it in this show because they don't listen to it and fuck them. Yeah, I I won't say names. (laughs) I'm I'm a good person. (laughs) Shit, man. They probably got bots for scrubbing everything. People probably pay bots to scrub to see if their name gets mentioned online. Right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And in fucking podcasts. If the record industry. If the fucking record industry can pay for bots to scrub for a song from like the late 60s that was a one hit wonder in Britain and we can get a copyright ding for that, there are bots that can scrub for anything. That's insanity. I mean, that is just insane. <laughs> yep. That's that's some fucking crazy shit. I don't I don't even know what to say about that. They someone paid for a bot. Man, that's fucked up. 
<laughs> I'm sure that there's like a bot that they just enter in the settings and it analyzes it compared against the song. But they well, still I'm they paid sh- an intern to scan the song or some shit. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. But they paid someone to fucking listen to Cinema Psyops just to fucking you know. No, no, they paid a bot. Bot. Yeah, yeah. They paid, they paid for, for, a, for bot. a bot. But they okay, they paid someone to make a bot. That's <laughs> <laughs> how they're getting to us, Matt. You see what they do to us? Yeah. You see what they're trying to do? They're trying to censor us. They're fucking trying to asshole. stop us from stealing their copyright. And that's fucked up because it's like we're like Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're we're not. <laughs> we're, we're fucking petty fucking pirates that are being bitchy because we can't make the show the way that court wants to make it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's true, but I wasn't going to say it like that. <laughs> Well, let's focus in on the what's what's good for this week. Uh, I hope you feel the same way, but the fucking movie was a real revelation. This was a first time watch for me. I'd never seen it before. Really? Oh, no. nice. Yeah, first. I mean, first time for me, and I uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. There is an image, however, that I had seen in like um, a horror movie magazine as a really young kid. It was actually like oh. um, I think it might have been my first exposure to Fangoria. And it's an image that's from this movie that has stuck with me and scared the living shit out of me for decades until I finally saw it. Now that I know where it came from and now I know a little bit more about what how that scene was made, it's significantly less terrifying to me. But I have legitimate cinematic trauma. Oh, really? Yeah. I can't wait to hear what scene it is. Yeah, but th- this has lasted me for as long as I can remember. I think I was like maybe seven or eight max when I saw this in my first Fangoria that I got to check out. Maybe. I, th- I think it was a Fangoria. Yeah. It might have been a Famous Monsters movie magazine. It was was some type of horror movie magazine that one of the older kids on the bus had that I probably shouldn't have been looking at at that age. So, <laughs> but it's an image from this movie that scared the shit out of me. Just the image, like no, no movement, nothing, just the image. <laughs> and when we get to it, we'll talk about it. All right, cool. <laughs> but um, the movie wrapped around this cinematic childhood trauma by proxy of magazine uh, actually turned out to be quite impressive for me. Um, I really enjoyed watching it. And I'm hoping that you're going to want to dig in on all the juicy details because they bury a lot of stuff under the surface. And while there's a lot of text, there's a lot of subtext to what's going on here, too. Yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. <laughs> all right. Well, if you're just as excited to talk about it as me, let's uh, let's move. Let's not tally. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do this shit. <laughs> let's sally forth and a bunch of other old timey sayings that I'm sally, too- <laughs> sally, sally forth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Whatever. Here's the Legion GoFundMe promo. Fuck off, man. <laughs> This is Bo from LegionPodcasts.com. Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar. For those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on, well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon. Don't 
I guess that song speaks for itself. Hey, Court, am I supposed to steal copyrights? Uh, no, I believe you are not. Okay. <laughs> so, so I just need to make sure of some things, you know? Yeah. So what other shows might be able to provide you with copywritten music that they can afford to pay for? I'm going to perform stupid impromptu vocals, and if they work, I won't cut them out. If they don't work, I'll fucking cut them out, and we won't speak of them ever again. Well, I hope the uh, trailer works out better for me. When was the last time you were afraid? Really afraid? Mephisto Waltz, the devil dancing with his pelamoos. I'd love to do a life mask of Miles. I'm not my husband's keeper. The Mephisto Waltz, a story of inner fear and ritual terror, and the ultimate transplant, the human soul. Bye, Miles. Mommy? He said he had to kill her. Some kind of bargain. Who? Duncan Eli. And now Duncan's dead. But you play like him. How did his brain get into your fingers? Paula, you're living in a nightmare. People who pray to the devil. Paula. Is it possible? Who are these people of the occult? What is their incredible power over others? How long does it take them to drive a woman out of her mind? The terrifying answers come each time you hear the Mephisto Waltz, the sound of terror. You killed Bill. You killed Abby. Now you want to kill me. Don't you play like him. How did his brain get into your fingers? You're living in a nightmare. People who pray to the devil. Is it possible? It is possible. Possible. Let's review it. No, right, because it is possible. To review the Festo it, yes. Waltz. So, the first 20 minutes, we start with a couple. Hey, Alan Alda's in this. Nice. He thought it was a chicken. He thought it was a cake. He thought it was a chicken. I thought well, it was this a time, chicken. This time he thinks the noises are a cat and a blue jay. Oh, uh, they're squawking and it wakes the couple up. Uh, we then cut to their daughter, who's doing some painting, and the phone rings, and she answers it because her parents are, apparently, they're always sleeping. So, fuck, you know. Thanks, thanks for, you know, diming us out about how badly, you know, their parents. Um, yeah, I really like the fact that the daughter instantly throws shade over her parents like it's yeah. nothing. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, she's like, yeah, my parents are sleeping. That's They're what they do. They're sleeping. lazy. They always sleep all day. Uh, Jesus, they wouldn't take care of me at all. Well, <laughs> she takes some messages from a man named Duncan uh, for her father. So then Miles, the husband, he heads to Duncan's place, and Miles meets Duncan, and Duncan's kind of an asshole. Uh, but then, and he's kind of treating Miles like an asshole. Miles is a journalist, a, a music journalist, and Duncan's obviously a piano player, seeing how in his living room he has two grand fucking pianos. So, uh, then, but then Duncan takes note of Miles' hands, and he asks him, you know, if he ever played, and he goes, yes, uh, because he said those are player hands. He goes, yes, he went to Juilliard, uh, and, you know, had, uh, had a show, uh, uh, and a, uh, and he said half were my family, half were critics, and he got a standing ovation, but the critics apparently didn't like it. Uh, which Duncan then commiserates with them, saying that critics don't know shit. Um, all this time he says, and then Duncan says he wants his daughter to see the hands so he comes down and uh she comes down she checks it out and so uh let's make a mental note of this folks he wants the daughter to inspect the hands and specifically asks if she thinks she'll like them yes he yes. does do that shit and it's creepy but it's passed over so quickly in the film it has to warrant being specifically pointed out everything is creepy between duncan and 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 his uh, daughter, Roxanne. Always. All creep, all the time. Hey, hey, Complete come sus. on, come on. As long as they're consenting adults, okay, but no. still. No, 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 no. Uh, anyway, he, uh, Miles then plays, and Duncan comments that her hands are one in a 100,000, and his daughter agrees. Uh, uh, so then he is invited, he and his wife, uh, are invited to a dinner party and they're having one. And then Miles later on plays with Duncan and he's having just a great time being able to play, uh, 
the piano again. Uh, then uh, Miles goes to his wife, Paula, and she says she's not feeling very well. She's feeling kind of ill. And he said, do you need anything? She goes, I'd like to leave. So they, they, they're getting out of there. And as they're leaving, Duncan's dog comes, starts growling at Paula and like, it wants to kill her. And it's like, fuck. And he's like, isn't it a magnificent beast? And I'm like, no, fucking learn how to train your dog, shithead. Did that look like a fucking Labrador that was like it pretending was, to was, be a fucking, a, <laughs> like bro, a German yeah, shepherd? It was definitely a Labrador that they were trying to make you think was a... Like a German shepherd or like yeah, a... Yeah, or a or, Rottweiler. Or a Rottweiler because, yeah, they were trying to make this cute little fucking Labrador look like it's such a threatening evil dog. Because every time, every time he was done with uh, that kind of stuff, all of a sudden, like, he was like, oh, now he's cute. And he was like, hey, sit. And you're like, that dog's fucking adorable. I don't care what anybody says. So the next day, uh, at Paula's, like, boutique, she owns a little boutique shop. Her and her partner are sitting there and business isn't great and no one's come in and they haven't really made any money and you know everyone's kind of dejected at this point which I, I suppose you would be um but then uh duncan and his whole entire entourage pull up and they start coming in buying lots of stuff paula is completely sus of duncan and roxanne at this point no one's this nice and she's she's just really like this is completely and utterly fucked so then uh, her partner was like, well, she comments that she remembers Duncan only because she read about him because his wife was killed by a dog. So some hardcore shit. With that cut to Paula and Miles are talking about the shop and, um, and Duncan and Duncan, how it's kind of, she was really suspicious of it. And she doesn't want to go to the New Year's party they were invited to. But Miles states how important this is to him, you know, about his music and his career. And so she decides to go and, and, you know, it, everything's fine. And there you go. That ends the first 20 minutes of the movie. So some setup there, little suspect of stuff, uh, a little incestual stuff. So there are hints at incest between a father and a daughter, but very yeah. consensual, very desire filled. Very naughty, very sinful, very okay by me in this case. You're Sex. fucking gross. You're just, you're just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> They're two consenting adults that are breaking the binds of normalcy and decency and doing whatever the hell they want. You know, I'm sure there's some other underlying evil stuff that he probably groomed her, which is really fucking gross to think that because yeah. it's your own daughter. So that is weird. Well, later on, you find out she married a 30 year old when she was 15. But yeah, things are we'll, we'll find out more and more like the yeah. more, more and more you hear about this is straight up abuse and is gross. The more you find out about this this family, the less Alan Alda's character should be enamored with them. But what they do is they shower him with so much love and affection and build him up, which clearly everyone else in his life has been beating him down to the point where he doesn't even bother typing for himself. He always makes his wife type the articles. So basically his wife is doing the work for him. He well, yeah, just basically it, tells her what he wants typed up and she does it. And more than that, they do a good job of hiding all this shit until they get what they want from Miles. Yes. You ever notice that? Yes. They they, they don't get exposed really until what they do to Miles already happens. Yeah, they so need, they need like some ingredients some... from Miles that will yeah. help make a plan come to fruition, it's... and they don't show themselves to be who they truly are. And Miles it... is so clueless when they do, but it's once they get those ingredients that they. But it's start already too it late for Miles when they start showing. Right. It's already too late for yeah, him. Yeah. So he doesn't even, uh, to give the Miles character a break, he doesn't even get a chance to be suspicious of these people. He's just like, and his wife, I believe, is just a naturally suspicious person, which works for her in this case. Oh, she's kinda. got serious fucking radar for this chick yeah, automatically. Yeah. She knows something's not right. She she knows when shit's fucked up. So, um, but anyway, we'll get to all that. Yeah. So we start the next 20 minutes. We're at this party. This is a wild shindig, man. Wild shindig. The dog's w walking around with like a human head on. Ding, 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 weird. ding. Here is my cinematic trauma. The photo of that fucking dog with that mask on. It, it did. It was really off-putting. You are you are not incorrect. I saw that when I was eight fucking years old. That was a nightmare fuel trying to figure out what that thing was supposed to be. Yeah, I, I don't blame you, man. That shit did me and you know that was uh that wasn't a good time yeah uh, well i didn't realize that that was this movie until i saw it and then like yeah. all that stuff came flooding back to me and i was like oh god when it came up on screen but i did some reading on it uh you'll never guess what that mask uh came from what that human face mask is uh yeah oh, where, what is it all right you remember how i told you that the halloween mask was a william shatner mask yeah that's that fucking mask on tampered with to make it look like the michael myers mask unpainted and everything 
with the eyes. Wow. That is the William Shatner fucking mask that got turned into the Halloween mask. It just had extremely curly hair for some reason in this, but it's that same cast. Which a lot of those masks do. So now that's going to haunt your nightmares because it's a dog walking around with William Shatner's face, which I know will haunt you. It will. As, you know what, though? It, it's not as bad as, uh, you know, as long as it's not acting like him. <laughs> Long pauses for no reason yeah. at all. Like, hey, bark. Growl. <laughs> <laughs> that was more Christopher Walken and still yeah, very awful. So let's it really move on. was, yeah. All right, but yeah, that was that that was my childhood nightmare trauma. There was seeing a picture of that fucking dog with just that face. That scared the shit out of me as a little kid. Yeah. So anyway, we're about to get our first view into some really fucked up shit. As Joanne's kind of walking around, she sees um uh Duncan and Roxanne. They 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 start kissing way more intimately than you should kiss your father. But at the party? Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, sticking their tongues down each other's throats but yeah. um Alan Alda's character doesn't notice it. This is where the wife is basically getting her suspicions confirmed because she already knows shit's up. Yeah. She already knows things aren't right. But when she sees that, she's like, oh, hell well, no. And Alan Alda isn't close to there yet. So he starts walking up and she's like, I just want to leave. She doesn't tell him what she saw, which would be, you know, the smart idea. Like, hey, dude, do you know what I just saw? <laughs> Yes, it, it, but also I don't think Alan Alda would have cared at this point, and uh, it's, it's still not too late for him here, but yeah. I don't think he would have cared. It's possible. I just, you know, it, open communication is always better than not. I mean, um, when you see a father and daughter openly like, kissing. Like, the first thing I want to do is, like, I, I, like where the fuck is court? Because I got to tell him about this shit because he's going to want to see it, first yeah, but, of all. Like, if That's you're, the first thing, I think. If you're up at a party and you see a, a father and daughter open mouth kissing with tongues all over each other, each other out in the open in front of all of their party guests like it's no big deal you want to make sure that your husband who brought you to this party is aware of such goings on with said family and then you make your judgments from there as to what to do with your husband right yeah you don't yeah. just you don't just cover it up and then just like you know usher him away and then try to like woo him away with manipulation later like this character chooses to do <laughs> yeah well anyway <laughs> and then it, it gets really weird because then she begs off because she's a little pissed and uh because she wants she just all she says she's not feeling well so she heads upstairs right when she heads upstairs some other lady not nobody who's anything in this movie she just comes up grabs miles and just starts making out with them so i, I don't know maybe they have an understanding i, I don't know <laughs> it maybe or maybe it's just that miles has been coming to these kind of parties for a little while now and he just doesn't give a fuck about his wife because he's being enamored and groomed by this family that's very possible yeah but, i mean or, we don't we don't really know they how could, much but again, time they could also have an understanding where it's just like hey you know when you're at a party it's a swiving it's a is this supposed to be the 60s or the 70s. It's like 1971, so I would say it's the late 60s is when this movie yeah, takes yeah, place. Yeah, you know, hey, listen, stuff happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just feel kind of like the the whole thing is he's being suckered in to this life of well, sin. Well, he's definitely being suckered in. Right. They're trying to sucker her in as well. Right, but it's you not know, it's not working on her. She's repulsed by it. She's not yeah. into what the the swinging happiness and all of the money and stuff. She's really suspect that they would open them into their lives so like wantonly just bring them in so like quickly and just throwing them lavish gifts and all of this kind of stuff. She's skeptical. The husband is just indulging it and wants to make it like last for as long as he can. Like he's solely already taken in by greed and just feeling like, you know, being made to feel so special from this father daughter love trifecta yeah. thing. And right. I, I feel like he's mentally already suckered in. So when they start asking things from him in return, he's already it's over with. Like he's already yeah. suckered in. He's going to give them anything he wants. They want because he so wants to be a part of this life that he's had shown to him. True. And uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. In this life. And also they, they're like, hey, you're just really good at music and all this shit. Things that he probably never got to hear from anyone other than his direct family. In which, you know, it, when you're an artist artist and shit like that do you really take any of that you know seriously yeah they're uh, fuck it i'm just gonna say it they are plying him with at least two of the seven deadly sins that we know for sure he is now a sucker for greed yeah. all of the lavish gifts with the money and everything the lifestyle he's getting he's greedy for
for it. He can't get enough of that. And also his pride. He's falling victim of them really building up his pride and making him feel like he had a missed opportunity and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So they're they're doing those two for sure. And then with the lady coming up and attacking him at the party and it seeming like he's into it, maybe they've been playing him through lust a little bit too. So he's got three of the seven deadly sins, you know. He's definitely yeah. envious of the piano player life and he definitely is covetous of the man's daughter too. So, you know, they've, they've got him plied there with yeah. more deadly sins. I mean, they're entangling him, but they're letting him make his own choices and get into his own volition just by simple temptation. This is one of the coolest examples of like a satanic seduction into a cult that I've seen put on film. And I'm not kidding. They really play it up well. And I want to point all these little things out that are in the film. All right. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Um, anyway, she walks away. I fucking away. warned you, dude. <laughs> no, you did. You did. Um, she walks away, and then we get a nice little shot of some naked woman just dancing. Um, thank you, movie. Thank you, movie. Uh, thank you. And I, one of my funny things was some guy went up and grabbed a tit, and she was like, uh-uh. She removed his hand. And I always wonder, was that maybe something that's supposed to be in the movie? Or just like, uh, just an actor getting overzealous, like, yeah, I'll grab a tit. And <laughs> the actress is like, um, no, that's, that's not the type of movie we're doing here. <laughs> he tied, he, he thought he was going to pull it off by saying he was improvising and maybe get a bigger yeah. part and also a, a free tit grab out of it. And she was like, no, you pleb, don't you fucking touch me. Are you, yeah, that's, fucking gross you piece of shit <laughs> go fuck yourself <laughs> and they caught it on film and they used yeah. it because it's the real director was whatever like, it is yeah, fuck yeah. It. we'll keep it i hope they at least got both of their permission to keep that in the film well fuck the right. guy for doing it but the girl if the if the lady was okay with it yeah fuck the guy we don't need his permission but the lady yeah yeah <laughs> unless so, it was unless it was planned to be in there which it looked very natural and real and i'm not just talking about the breast yes so paula goes up and she walks into an office area and uh, she sees a bunch of fate like pl- uh, uh, m- uh, plastic mold faces on the wall. Uh, plaster. Uh, plaster. That's what I meant. Plaster mold faces on the wall. And it's kind of like a lot of art. And then all of a sudden the dog comes in and is growling. And right before you think that dog's going to jump her, uh, Roxanne comes in and calms him and like pets him. She's like, isn't he such a sweet little boy and all that. And- you're, you're missing an important detail. She, oh, go she goes snooping around and looks at all the different art. It is creepy and everything. She goes over to this curio cabinet that's like all this wire but you can see what's in there yeah. there is a very suspicious looking spell book which i can't remember the title of it now off the top of my head it's but i reckon something yeah i recognized it and i'm like oh fuck you know it was one of those things where when i saw that book i knew that that was some kind of like dark magic spells kind of thing oh, and there was a bottle of blue stuff yeah there's like a vial but it looks like a um almost like a holy reliquary type uh mm-hmm. like chamber <laughs> for you know like specifically doling out this type of fluid like a like a baptismal yeah. kind of you know you'd be able to drip stuff from it it's very ornate and it's also set on a very specific base and then there's um some other satanic symbols and things like that or or things that could be perceived as satanic and magic symbols about yeah there's like this whole altar thing and it's locked and the dog doesn't give two fucks about her until she tries to open the cabinet that's when the dog comes in and gets super aggressive with her yeah it's true it's like hey fuck you bitch what are you doing in here <laughs> she still tries in here she still tries to go for the cabinet even though the dog is growling at her and that's when the daughter comes in and that's yeah. when the dog goes away because she wouldn't dare try to just open the cabinet and snoop around with the daughter there and so they decided to escalate it that way instead of having her get attacked by the dog given the main character a reason to leave yeah and never come back because if the dog got attacked by the wife the wife could forbade him from seeing them yes so um anyway uh they're walking uh they're walking down together down the stairs and she's like hey did you like my art and she's like no not really um to be honest, no, she was too realistic of war for her. And she likes a lot, maybe easier art. Then she asks if she can make a plaster of mold of, of Miles' face. Because she thinks, she goes, don't you think his face is beautiful, his bone structure? She goes, no, he's good looking. But she goes, I'm not. She goes, so can I do him? Which is some undertone shit. And she's like, ah, I'm not my husband's keeper. Here's so, where Matt starts to think that maybe they have the swinging relationship. This is because she says, I'm not my husband's keeper. And the lady literally said, so can I do him? Yeah, I, I don't know. And. I admit, and I could be just wrong, but it's just like, I don't know, man. I get this kind of feeling that they got, they had some sort of arrangement, if you will. So, anyway, then we cut to the mold is happening, and that is our first clip. Married twice, once at 15 to an old man, almost 30. Duncan had it annulled. 
cost him lots of money. Did you always call him Duncan? I guess I always have called him Duncan. Dad would be entirely too domestic and lace curtain for a man like him. There were lots of affairs in between. And then I married once more and divorced. I suppose I should have stayed. He was such a, a nice, simple, rugged, intelligent man. <laughs> He's vice president of Western Oil out here. Duncan, what's the matter? Uh, fate. That's one of those. hands, they're ice cold. Shall I get your medicine? Oh, thank you, I took it. it. It doesn't help. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. <laughs> you're the one that looks sick. Though I expect you'll be better as soon as it's peeled off and cast. People should be born at 70 and live their lives backward. The present arrangement simply doesn't make sense. I'm awake. Oh. Have a nice time? Murder. We, we killed three bottles of champagne. With Roxanne. And Duncan. Hey, you know something? He had me play the Mozart again. And I was pretty good. Maybe stoned on champagne is how I ought to live. Well, it's your bourbon out of pink. Yeah, oh, that's the... You know, the plaster. I hate Roxanne. Naturally. I don't want to go there anymore, and I don't want you to go there either. Why? Would you just explain because to me why? Because they're too damn friendly. Why? Don't shout. There's some things I can't say without shouting. Do you mind? Look, they like us. They like you. They think they think Abby is the most wonderful child in the Western world, and they like me too. Of course they do, but it's all too sudden. Oh, baby, what is it? What's the matter? You know, I mean, really. I'm scared. That's ridiculous. I'm, I'm the son he never had. Oh, fine. Is he the father you never had? Miles, may I remind you that you've already got one father? He's a druggist in Providence, Rhode Island, remember? Anything more than that is bigamy or something. Duncan Eli's dying. No. Yeah, he told me himself tonight. He's had leukemia for eight months. He keeps changing his blood every two weeks, but it doesn't do any good. He's going to die. I'm sorry, really. He told me not to tell anybody, but I guess it's all right. He's a great man. He's a great artist. He's maybe the greatest since the invention of the piano forte. He's never going to give another concert. Wow, that was four and a half minutes of downer. Yeah, right? Wah, wah. But, I mean, okay, so now we're getting a clear view of why they're befriending. I mean, not the clearest of views, but it's it's coming. It's, See, ordinarily, it's, if this were just a uh, like a Lifetime movie drama type thing, they would just want yeah. his bone marrow because they're a genetic match. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> and so they're going to offer him a bunch of money for his bone marrow and continue to, you know, let him live because of his bone marrow. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah. something like that. But this is a supernatural movie. So we, we have to have, you know, different reasons. Right. And um, I also wanted to point out, Duncan needs constant blood transfusions or needs a lot of blood transfusions to keep him yeah. going. 
and mm-hmm. their effectiveness has been dwindling. This is due to his leukemia. This is a very vampiric extension of his life, almost supernatural cause, that they could just be using the leukemia as an excuse as to why he's getting blood. <laughs> that is very true. Yes. It may be sustaining his life, but uh, it's they're still running out of time, and they have yeah. to accelerate what they're doing now in the plan. So, um, Miles is then we cut to Miles is actually giving blood uh, for uh, uh, Duncan. Then Roxanne, the nurse gets done, Roxanne sends her away and gives Miles some broth or something to drink to help him with his strength. She says, you know, she suggests that he take a nap. She's going to be pretty co- tired. And he crashes and crashes a little bit harder than probably what he should. So he's probably drugged. Powerful and, drugs have been insinuated into his soup. Yes. And she uh, creepily says, bye, Miles. And that's sus as fuck. Uh, nothing um, suspicious about that in any way, shape or form. She has drugged his soup. And he will no longer be Miles. Yes. So now we have cloudy vision of Roxanne working uh, Miles uh, or uh, marking Miles with a blue paint on his forehead like a Simba. Yeah, it's supposed Um, to be the liquid from the vial. Like there's something special about the liquid from the vial and he's being marked. Yep. Then we see um, Duncan. He's reading out of that book and almost more like chanting out of that book. Roxanne makes a pentagram uh, out of that blue stuff and puts a candle in the middle. She lights it. I just want to point out every pentagram drawn in this movie. I did a better job on my fucking book covers in grade school drawing pentagrams (laughs) than these. They all look terrible. None of them had like the circles were all wonky and the stars were all off center. Whoever did that needed to fucking measure it to make it more impressive. Yeah, it wasn't the best. Um, so, uh, she, um, okay. So all this is happening in Duncan's room as he reads out the book. And then he asks if it's 12 yet. Then she gives him a drink and he dies. And she opens a case and brings out Miles's mold and puts it on Duncan's face, then leaves. Um, we get a lot of wind and then the candle blows out. Miles wakes up and he is very disoriented, crawls, he gets up, he looks at himself in the mirror and rubs the blue off his forehead. And uh, then he walks downstairs and finds Roxanne listening to the uh, piano recording of her father. And then he starts looking at his hands. And that ends that 20 minutes. Okay, uh, we need to uh, talk about the blood transfusion thing and what we just seen right here in this ritual. I I think it's pretty clear what's going on. I mean, it's body swapping. It's obvious. They even say it in the tagline and they kind of hint at it in the trailer. He's specifically been set up so that Duncan's soul can be manifested into his body and take control so it's like a possession but what they're essentially doing is they are killing miles and replacing his soul with duncan's yeah that is exactly what they're doing and they are nonchalant about it you know they are non-apologetic where's miles soul going whenever he's exported out of the body where what where do you think where, where do you think he's going where do, what do you think he's going to, to hell do you think that's probably duncan, part of the deal do you think duncan is trading him another soul for another life Lifetime, like we saw in that Prime Evil movie? Uh, that very well could be, yeah. That's the deal, something right? Like that, like a, a soul, soul for a, a soul. lifetime? Yeah, a soul yeah. for a lifetime. But also there's something else that he has to do on top of this, so that must be get rid of the cancer the next time around and let me live even longer and healthier life for the additional part of the deal that he has to do. Or maybe he's done this deal so many times he has to do more than one, remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but I think he's probably just at his limit at this point point of what he needs and not not limit but he's he's at you know he just needs to get a soul going and uh just needs to get out there and 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 work his uh work his magic for less than a better or uh, for lack of a better term um and so this is it this is uh this is happening i think this is the point do you think miles dies here or do you think it's more of a slow go no i think he's gone he's uh, gone. i think what's basically happening is it duncan has to get his shit together back in that body in that scene where he's crawling around and he doesn't recognize it and things don't feel real for him and he's just getting situated and then what you're about to describe in the next 20 minutes what brings him around what eased the passage between the two of them is Duncan yeah. was teaching Miles to play like Duncan and so true. he was slowly training Miles to feel and think like Duncan anyway and was slowly supplanting his will onto Miles anyway which is what I was getting at like this is a so serious satanic seduction they lure him in by giving him everything he could ever want but there's a price to pay for all of this and it's the rest of his eternal life 
he's he's going to be stuck in hell. And now Duncan can take him, you know, take over his body and keep going as part of the deal. So this this whole thing that we've seen has been a working of this magic trick to switch him over or this spell that they finally did. Like, but I think it took this entire process and all they needed the ingredients were the mask and Duncan's or, or and Miles's blood for Duncan. And you notice the massive amount of blood they needed to take in order to do this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a blood transplant before in some um, magical stuff that I've read or, or various stories about the occult and things like that, blood transfers were somewhat believed to be able to supplant a soul from one to another. There's another movie that deals with something very serious to that where someone found a way to gain immortal life by sacrificing another soul and they were doing it through blood transfusions. Uh, it was released here in the States as Close Your Eyes is what it was called. It was like from the early 20 aughts, but it's very similar to that. So when I saw this and they took his blood and then this ritual happened, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so there you um, go yeah so now we start the next 20 minutes miles comes home he tells paula that duncan died and then uh well then he bones her like in a real like an almost animalistic way he needs her and she loves it uh that makes her very happy uh yeah she's basically getting boned by duncan because he knows more of what to do he just yeah. now has a younger body to be able to do the stuff that he learned over all those years of boning his daughter and now and he's using cut- it to her advantage <laughs> yeah, right. And then they cut to the funeral, and Roxanne, uh, uh, she puts the blue stuff on the casket, then speaks in another language from that book. Um, and Paula wonders what their mumbo jumbo is about. And then, because we always do this in this show, we're cutting to the will reading in our next clip. Duncan Mowbray Eli, a resident of the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles and the state of California, being of sound mind and disposing memory to make, publish, and declare this my last will and testament, hereby revoking any and all wills and codicils thereto by me heretofore made. Item one. In recognition of my affection for Miles Clarkson, I give, devise, and bequeath to him one of my Steinway pianos and my entire collection of musical scores for his personal enjoyment and use in the hope that he will continue his interest in music, for which I believe he has such an extraordinary talent. Furthermore, I direct that within one week of my demise, my executors pay to the said Miles Clarkson the sum of $100,000 cash, such sum to be drawn from my personal checking account. Miles, I don't believe it. This sum I bequeath to the said Miles Clarkson for his support and maintenance, though it is hoped he will use it to further his musical career, if he so chooses. Item two. To my daughter, Roxanne Delancey, I hereby bequeath my home in Los Angeles, California, and all of its contents. So he's got a pretty nice, substantial sum of money, especially for 1969. <laughs> yes, and this whole entire thing. This is why I think he's already got the. He's already got. Yeah. This is why he's already taken over. They're just basically buying time and making it look right because now the daughter has the house and he has all the money, and you know he's going to probably vow to take care of the daughter. Blah blah blah. Because it's only right, even though you know she got the house and she could sell it, he's going to help her monetarily. Well, or they'll be together to support I'm, I'm also sure that that's not all their money <laughs> the daughter's probably still very rich right yeah i'm sure she's got her own money in some way shape or form that she was able to make off the back of her father's money or something along those lines but even still you know they have it set up to where their fates are even more intertwined now and you know it would be hard for anyone to wonder why he would be spending time with the daughter of the man that gave him this fortune you know what i yeah. mean <laughs> and trying to watch out for her. He has an excuse now, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Oh, very true. So then the couple, they take a vacation, uh, Paula and 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 uh, Miles, down to, down to, it seems down to Mexico, where they've been before, apparently. This is kind of like maybe where they had their honeymoon. Well, in the old hotel, they, all of a sudden, all these church bells go off, and he starts wondering what the hell's that noise. She goes, don't you remember? We're right next to all the churches. And she goes, remember this? She turns on the faucet, and it starts making a god-awful noise. But he doesn't remember uh and then they then they bone then they definitely they bone again the uh sex scenes in this film are really passionate although they're 
relatively tame. This was like late 60s, early 70s heat that you would see in yeah. these kind of films. Like, and they're really kind of, they're, they're they're not necessarily pushing the envelope, but they're definitely like nudging at it a little bit. Like they're poking at the envelope, seeing if they want to push it. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, So then the uh, couple gets home and we see Duncan's dog is now with their daughter. Uh, The dog kind of growls at Paul again. She states that she has to give it back and her daughter's very sad and cries. And then her friend Maggie comes up, who's been watching their daughter, and they talk and Paula comments how Mike is like almost three different men now. He comes in and he tells the daughter, uh, you know, they, they sit there with the dog. She goes, can I keep him? Can I keep him? And he pets the dog a little and all of a sudden he like goes into a trance and then says, and then says they can of course keep the dog. So again, it's almost like part of Miles and part of... Uh, uh, Duncan are in there. Well, I would say that Duncan doesn't maybe have 100% full control. Yeah. Like he hasn't 100% pushed all of Miles out. He's getting there. But, uh, you know, because Miles was acting a bit like, oh, just kind of how Miles has always acted with his daughter. And then, you know, shit got, you know, real for them. Oh, so. well, I think that that was Duncan pretending to be Miles because of something that happens later on with the daughter in the movie. And yeah, I think they, he was setting it up here. It did seem to be like, you know, uh, forced, uh, not forced. It seemed like he went into a trance when the dog, uh, you know, when he touched the dog, almost kind of like, you know, something snapped in him. And then he said, of course, you can keep the dog. My much to the wife's dismay. I think he was putting a spell on the dog that was going to transfer yeah. something over to the girl because she was going to spend time with him and hang out with him and keep him in a room. Well, that's possible. Okay, that's possible. The dog um, is a conduit, like a familiar for a casting spell. Yeah. So then, uh, so then he decides he's like, well, let's say, what are we going to have for dinner? And they don't really know. And then he's like, we'll have, to, well, first of all, he pours the selfie. He goes, we need better scotch in this house. Uh, he goes, this stuff's terrible. And then he goes, uh, we're going to have Japanese tonight. I love Japanese. And says, we're inviting and everyone out and he says Maggie and the doctor and so he's like everyone's going out. They go out for uh, some uh, dinner and Roxanne joins them with some guy named Richard and she states they're going out of town and asks if the couple would stay at the house and gives them the keys and they of course agree. Uh, then uh, we then cut to Paula's dropping off a letter or a check or something to Miles and that's our next clip. Why didn't you call me? You could have read it over the phone. I know. Are you stunned? Four hundred dollars, hardly. Oh, Miles, I think it's beautiful. Just for pinning down, can he lie down on paper? Those who can do, those who can't write clever little interviews. About equally divided between snide and admiring. Why do you want to be somebody else? Because I'm nobody the way I was. It's true, you've changed. Well, it's horribly exciting. It's not comfortable the way it used to be. Still, in the morning, I can't bear to have you pull away from me. It leaves me feeling all empty. Was that you on the piano just now? Why didn't you like it? Well, I did, but it was frightening. It was one of Duncan's last tapes. Miles, why did you say that? This tape machine is cold. Oh, well, hello, Roxanne. Hello, Paula. Beautiful day. Hello, Miles. What happened to Bermuda? Oh, there was some silly hurricane so Richard wouldn't fly. Well, I won't either, not with a coward. You know, all the interesting men are either married or not worth the effort. Stop, go on. That was you I heard outside, wasn't it? It's unbelievable. Why, I've been playing 18 hours a day. 24, you practice in your sleep. But it's not just technique. It's also faith. Duncan gave me that faith, nobody else. So if I try to play like him, that's not surprising, is it? No. You're right and I'm wrong. I think you should do whatever you want to do. I'm going to call my friend, Mr. Yorok. I think Miles can take over Duncan's concert a week from Friday. I accept. 
So we see kind of a lot more weird shit starting to happen. Uh, and Miles is changing because I think he would have been like really excited to get that $400 uh, for writing. But now he's, you know, obviously not. Well, um, and he talks down about a profession that he did really seem to enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, but uh, the way that he talks down about it is really fucking not pompous like and arrogant and very yeah. much like Duncan and not Miles. So I think Miles is completely gone. I think at this point, you're right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Miles then plays some more, and the women have a stare-off, which is weird. And that night, um, Paula has a nightmare of the dog attacking the doll. A, a, a doll. And then she sees Duncan walk in, holding the blue stuff. Uh, he tells her he doesn't want to hurt the child, but he demands it. Uh, and then he goes in the room, and he puts the blue stuff on the child's head. We then see uh, Paula wakes up, and Abby's st- st- standing next to her, and she's crying. She had a nightmare as well. She feels warm to Paula, so they go to put her back into bed. And we, like, see Miles. Uh, they think he's asleep, but he's sitting there wide awake, so he knows what's going on. I say Miles, Duncan, but, you know, for sake of the movie. For yeah. For sake of the notes here. I think it's just easier. Um, she tucks, Paula tucks her in, and the dog is gone. It ran out of an open window, and Paula's starting to wonder, like, how, how'd that window get open? And, uh, Paula's soothing her, and, and as she, like, rubs her head, she finds there's a blue mark on her forehead, and that ends that 20 minutes. So, some not good things happening for the family. All right, so, he demands it is the one that... Duncan made the deal with to be able to take over Miles's body. I told you the dog is a fucking conduit to the spell casting. Yes. Pure and simple. Spell casting done via the dog. He used the dog's entrance into this girl's life as like his his way in to be able to do what he needs to do. And I think he astral projected from Miles's body to perform this spell in the room. Yeah. That, that's that's what they were kind of implying. And I think this dreamy haze like thing that they keep doing is like to sing like to, to just basically show you a sort of out of body astral projection and the camera is what that soul is seeing as it's moving around and doing things and the missus has a natural ability and talent for that and satanists are known to fight in some various lore using astral projection and you know soul shit like that <laughs> that's uh some various lore that the christians lashed onto in their anti-satanist uh propaganda that i've read <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i'm just i'm throwing all these little tidbits devoured. at you yeah yeah like they're like oh this is supposed to scare you i'm like no this is awesome how do i join this satanist cult <laughs> this is great how do i get involved uh-huh. <laughs> send me literature on how do i join and i don't mean for paying 200 bucks just for a membership card uh, you, me- you, me- you message them they're like you need to be afraid of this and you message them, i definitely am definitely afraid tell me where all these people are located so i know to stay away from those places just let me know where these places places are the exact addresses and maybe a good contact name to get a hold of or not to get a hold of i just want to make sure i know who to stay away from (laughs) well that was a long way to go for that joke but thanks (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) so we start the next 20 minutes um abby is now in the hospital uh the doctors don't know what's wrong with her yet but they're confident they'll figure it out in the waiting room uh paula tells miles that abby has had convulsions and you know had other problems and then she stops and asks him if dreams are real um that that and that's just how that scene ends Later on, the doctor walks in and lets them know Abby has died. They just couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. Paula says she knows what happens and uh, she states she knows what's going on with the blue oil and she runs out. Um, at that point, Miles catches her and this leads to a confrontation in our next clip. Wait for That's not going to help. Because I'm so scared. I know, but I'm here. Don't run away from me. Miles has come true. What? What did? He said he had to kill her. Some kind of bargain. Who? Duncan Eli. He said you had these great hands like Lord Maninoff. And now Duncan's dead. But you play like him. As well as he did. I've heard you. How did his brain get into your fingers? Paula, you've got to stop talking like this. Oh, he's dead. I know he's dead, but ever since the night he died, everything has changed. You have changed in the way you make love. Polly, you're living in a nightmare. You better wake up. I know. Don't you think I know? It's hideous. 
And suppose it's true. That book she had, Roxanne. People who pray to the devil. Paula. Is it possible? Do such things happen? Those faces in the library. My little girl. You gotta calm down. Maybe the doc can give you some medication, something to help you sleep. Why did they kill her? Was it really some kind of bargain? They put the order right here. So what happened? Olive, stop it! Oh, Miles, tell me the truth! Tell me the truth! Even more of a bummer from this clip. Yeah. Uh, well, this this movie's not exactly happy, happy, fun time. I disagree. Uh, fuck you. You would disagree with a child dying. No, I wouldn't. Actually, I would be encouraging that. You're fucking wrong. Uh, <laughs> Paula does this some research and reads about a Slayer dog being hung by a Swiss town. Um, and she reads about uh, 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 how the murder, and you hear her talking, how the murder, they have footsteps going in, but nothing coming out. Then she finds Roxanne's ex-husband, this guy who owns this business, and he's like, she's like, did a dog really kill the mother? He goes, no, that was superstition from a town. And he's like, I hate my ex-wife. And he's talking, he goes, these people, they go, they just say they believe things that aren't real to give them permission to do things. She then says that she thinks Roxanne killed her daughter. And at that point, he can't, he doesn't freak out, but he, he kicks her out of his office. Then we cut to Miles playing his show, and he gets a standing ovation from everyone but his wife. Everyone thinks he's just amazing. And then we see Rox, uh, Roxanne's ex is staring at Paula. He's there. Well, after the show, Paula sees Miles whispering things into Roxanne's ear, and then she runs into the ex-husband, and he tells her that uh, he really, the reason he asked her to leave today is he wanted to forget everything being married to these people. And that, they, you know, again, they believe in things that aren't real to give them permission to do things and then he gives her a matchbox or a, a, a pack of matches that have his phone number in it and um he says you know he wanted to forget but then the story of her child he's like i i should help then Roxanne walks up and tells them uh, that Miles is now going to take over all of Duncan's dates for his shows. And so the ex-husband says, okay, that's great. And he leaves and she tells, she warns Paula to stay away from him, that he's dangerous and a fraudulent man. So, and, and Paula was like, actually, I think he's quite nice. So uh, anytime, it's really funny, anytime Roxanne tells Paula something... Paula goes, says the exact opposite to her. <laughs> yeah, she's basically saying, bitch, don't tell me how to live. Yeah, pretty much. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah, she's a very uh, controlling for a Satanist who believes that the whole of the law is do as thou wilt. Yeah, I, I think they pick and choose what they believe. They're, they're, they're salad they bar are, Satanists. They are to Satan uh, to to Satanism what uh, more Chris, most Christians are to Christianity. Yeah, they salad pick bar, and choose what they want to believe. Salad bar Satanists, just like salad bar <laughs> Christians. Yeah, yeah, just just they pick and choose what the fuck they want to do. Hashtag salad bar <laughs> Satanists. Yeah. Then Paula meets the ex for a drive, and they're driving around. She tells him how they made. She believes they made body deals with the devil to you know sacrifice one they'll get uh, an, uh they'll be able to transfer themselves into another body at this point he almost gets into a wreck because he's listening to her and they almost fucking get ran into by a semi that night they're kind of at a beach house and he tells her that after the mother died roxanne went and, like climb like climb this hill in the middle of a snowstorm and she had a miscarriage um Paula is obviously very sympathetic towards him, but he tells her not to worry. It wasn't his, and it was actually a. It's a good thing that she miscarried because it was a beast. And she asks why, and he goes, I, "He has no proof, but he still knows it for fact that um uh that that child was Duncan's child." And then he leaves to go for more wood, and that ends that twenty minutes. Okay, so he basically just flat out knows that Duncan was tapping his daughter, which was this dude's wife, while they were married. Married and that it's Duncan's baby that got thrown in her and it turned out to be a monster and I don't think it's just deformed that he was referring to I think there was some devil in that baby I think there was a devil in that baby but I think there's so much devil in that baby but I think they're gonna try again with a different body that doesn't belong to the father of the daughter yeah and they think that that's think so. that's part of the reason why they're doing the switch beyond the fact that Duncan is dying it's yes. it gives them an opportunity to try this particular thing again all right well well, we're going into our final 20 minutes of the movie. The next day, Paula wakes up and she's alone and she noticed the fire is well out, so no new wood was brought up. Uh, she go 
goes down. She starts looking for him. And she finds him on the beach as he lays there dead with a blue mark on his forehead. She is questioned by the police, and that is our next clip. We were not drunk. We were not taking drugs. And we were not lovers. What else were you not? I wasn't with him when he was killed. He was out here by himself. You made a statement. You said you knew how he died. Now, regardless of whether you think we poor cops will understand or we won't understand, you're going to explain to me exactly what you meant. I think Bill Delancey was killed by my husband. You said he was out of town. It's a pretty good trick. Killing a man all the way from Chicago, Illinois. He's not really my husband. Oh, why is that? Someone's using his body. Well, I guess that pretty well clears this case up. That could be so, misinterpreted as sex. Yeah. So she is definitely now knows what's happening. She's she's really up on everything. Well, she gets back home and she sees a note from Miles that he is now on his way to San Francisco. He stopped in. He can't wait to see her when he gets back. She goes to sleep and her ring starts glowing red. She has a dream of Miles and Roxanne standing over her. She says that Miles is now Duncan and that they killed Bill and Abby. He holds her down and she puts the blue mark on her forehead. Then Miles starts kissing her before Roxanne tears Miles off and starts to go to town with him instead. In the vision, uh, Miles then changes into Duncan and Duncan's making out with Roxanne, which is how it is. And it's a little she, hotter that way anyway. Oh, dude. Come on, man. <laughs> come on. <laughs> They're dude. just trying to drive the incest home. There's nothing wrong with that, dude. <sighs> Roll Tide, I guess. Oh my god, just fucking incest already. Listen, I get it, everyone. I like the South, too. So, she wakes <laughs> up with uh, and she has a blue mark on her head and she feels like shit and then she checks the note and she realizes that's not miles's handwriting she then goes through the clothes and find the keys to the house so she heads to roxanne's home uh and we see someone's watching from the window uh she then goes up into the office and she gets into the cabinet that iron lock cabinet with a knife and finds the blue stuff which she starts pouring into its own little jar just then um the wind blows the wind windows open and all of a sudden uh the dog attacks her after some back and forth the dog gets ready to launch itself and she holds out that knife she had and she stabs it killing the dog this is where her character goes full evil yes she went <laughs> for killing the dog yeah the minute she I mean, slaughtered the dog though, the dog was trying to kill her was it though or was it just coming for snuggles it just doesn't know how to not play fight no 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 because we've seen that dog knows how to snuggle with everyone but her so it was definitely trained to kill her fine much like they probably trained the last dog to kill uh, Roxanne's mother. Fine. Still but still, it's not the dog's dog. fault. They yeah. trained it to do that. Yeah, it was bad, a bad owners. owners. Not the dog's fault. Yeah. But unfortunately, Paula didn't have any choice in this matter. Still um, wrong. It's it, it feels really wrong. Um. So then uh, she takes the blue stuff in a vial and she grabs the book. Driving back, she starts to get the spins and images of the dog, all this, and she crashes her car. She wakes up in the hospital to find out she had a mild stroke, which caused the accident. She is then talking to her friend, and that is our final clip. What day is it, Meg? It's Tuesday afternoon. Two weeks. Three. I've got to get out of here. So many ways to kill a person. Sometimes I'm afraid to drink the water. It might be poisoned. Isn't that silly? They haven't given up. I know they haven't. They killed Mrs. Eli. And Abby. And Bill. Then they tried to murder me. Well, I'm just one grade too tough. Paul, if I didn't know you were sane, I'd think you were a little crazy. They made a big fat bargain with the devil. So they could enjoy each other. Father and daughter. And they realized that I knew what they were doing. They tried to kill me. Paula, why don't you just face the truth? What? All they are is a thing on a double bed. You're Miles and that Roxanne bitch. Listen. 
Abby had some rare kind of virus. Bill Delancey, he just had a little too much to drink. And as far as Mrs. Eli was concerned, she probably had a very bad heart. All I know about is you. Paula. You're sick. And you're going to stay sick. Unless you make up your mind to just get up and... and get a divorce. No. I want Miles. Whoever he is, I still want him. Even if it's just once more. So now we see Paula starting to lose it a little bit. She, no, no, she's she, not losing it. She's becoming sane in a crazy world and realizing what it is that she has to do to well, win she this knows fight. She likes what Miles is now. She likes Duncan in Miles' body. Yeah, he gave her that good dicking that Miles was never capable of, that he's all experienced. So now she's going to go broke and do her own super evil thing. I mean, she's already killed a dog. Her soul's damned to hell, so now it's time. <laughs> Saying, I understand the dog was trying to kill you, but sorry, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna have to side with the good guys on this one, because uh, we don't normally do that, but yeah, you you belong here. Yeah, you, you did some horse shit right there, lady. I, why, why would you kill a dog? He was looking for belly rubs. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in that, in all seriousness, if a dog is attacking you to the point where you fear for your life, yes, you try to yeah. disable it. It just yeah. so happened that she killed it in one fell swoop. Yes. Um, so anyway, uh, she reads from the book and she makes her own little pentagram. She then hears footsteps and the door opens and she says, Master, I'm ready to bargain. She goes to Roxanne's and the she tells the butler, so she drives to Roxanne's house, tells the butler that um, some uh, uh, kids were breaking their headlights outdoors and, you know, a lot of rich board kids and he is like oh man so he thanks her and he goes to check that out when he leaves she locks the front door yeah she tells him to put the rolls away yeah uh wait well, she finds roxanne and tells her that the master is on her side now roxanne tells her she's crazy and she's weird and she then knocks her out it takes her blood and a plaster mold of her face that was hung up uh she goes out on her deck and asks Miles to help uh, as the phone rings. It's her friend getting her flowers, and the phone just keeps ringing, so she decides she'll take it to her herself. She, then she go. the friend gets to the house. She's going through it. She hears running water, and we find out, we see Paula has committed suicide. Cut her, cut her wrists, uh, and she's in the bathtub, but she has Roxanne's plaster face on her face. She performed the same ritual. She just did it in quicker time. She's already yep. made her de deals with the devil there uh, earlier that we saw when she drew the pentagram and all of that. So this has been her plan all along once she stole the stuff and got started in the dark arts. Once she was like, okay, well, I guess I can do this now too. You know, I, I can be awesome. And her motivation <laughs> is somehow even more dark and twisted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so then uh, we see Maggie is with her doctor friend, the doctor friend, which you know I think might be even her boyfriend. And she shows him that she had the plaster and she's hiding it from the cops. She doesn't want anyone to know that Paula believed in that crap uh, at, at the end. Um, so then uh, Miles, then we see he gets home or gets back to Roxanne's house and he informs quote unquote Roxanne of what happened, uh, the suicide. And as she's all happy about it, she he smells a different perfume and he goes, what is that? She goes, oh, I changed the perfume. Do you like it? And he goes, no, I don't like it. It reminds me of that, you know, that uh, frilly housewife we just got rid of and yep uh, and then they embrace and start making out and we get the idea that that's not roxanne anymore that's paula paula got the dude in the end it's paula and dustin or, and, duncan. Uh, or uh duncan and roll credits So Paula got a life free of the binds of having to take care of a daughter. She is super, super rich. Daddy is fucking her to the point where she is in total sheer ecstasy every night because he's so good at it. And now that he thinks he's giving it to his daughter, he's going to give it to her even better than when he was forced to do it just to make her happy. She's totally fine with all of that because she is now full on fucking evil. She fell it backwards is. into natural powers for Satan 
Satanism in the context of this movie's beliefs. And the other folks had to work so fucking hard at it. She didn't even need a modicum of the amount of blood that they needed to get Duncan to switch over to Miles. And she just was able to do it with her own sheer power. That has got to be one of the better endings I've seen in a movie. Uh, just the, the twist of it. And it's just, just this woman it, who's, who's who's been fighting, 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 and then literally everything she had was taken away from her. Uh, and But instead of doing the one thing they thought she would do, which would be either commit suicide or even be the one thing we thought she would do, maybe as an audience, fight these people and, and find a way to defeat them. Nope. She instead goes, God, when I was with this form of Miles, it was he was so much more assertive, so much more successful, so much better, not a fucking drip. And not a fucking forgetful asshole about everything. All right. Well, let's just let's just face it here. Miles didn't know how to find the G spot or also the clitoris or how to or do his, both at the same time with his magical hands. Nor did he know how to find did. a career or take care of his wife. Right. Duncan, however, did. And Duncan yeah. in Miles's body made her come harder than she's ever come before. And that's the sole purpose as to why she's doing this. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, the, the the sex and I think also the success. You know, also the, the money, the money, yeah. all the all the power. This different life they're gonna have now. And um, yeah. So, but I thought when you see her decline, and it's not like it's something that happens. Like it's not one of those snap. Like, ooh, gotcha endings. It slow builds, and you see it coming, and you're like, no, no, Paula. And then you're like, shit, she's gone. She's going to do it. And she is. And she's gone. And she does it. And she succeeds at it. And you're like, that is fucking awesome. Just the way they did that was fucking stupendous. And the way that they end up portraying it at the very end, nobody's really all that happy. Nobody's really all that comfortable with the choices that they made to got them where they no. are. They're no, just, no they one's... continue to exist and live a lavish life of excess, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. You're not very happy as a watcher about this ending. No, no. The... I, I mean, the peop- even the characters don't seem all that fucking happy, and they aren't really living with themselves for what they're doing. Well, right. I think Paul is very happy right now. Oh, I, I, think... I think Paul has gone around the bend and once yeah, she kind I think of Paul is snapped I think once she comes her to, daughter yeah once she comes to grips with what she's done and like yeah. the sex stops being interesting Paula's gonna have a real dark night of the soul oh yeah yeah Paula will leave but right now Paula is real fucking happy <laughs> well yeah she won and she's elated because she's about to get that good dicking again that's and maybe all. and maybe that's gonna last her for a lifetime too so I'm just saying because because it's also because he's so many because he still has has pieces of miles in him much like uh i, I think their the pieces get left behind so she's always interested because it's a different person all the time well and, and it's hinted that uh duncan has done this before and there was somebody yeah. else that has merged so, with duncan before the daughter came along so you get all these different people and he's so much and now he's more worldly and he'll you know and now who knows how much more he's going to be happy thinking that this is just roxanne he's with so it's going to be oh man i mean what an ending what a great movie. This really was a good, well-acted movie. I thought the acting was good. I, I liked it. Yeah, I'm really, really surprised and pleasantly so. I'm extremely, extremely joyous that I we got to watch this in the time frame that we did, and it was just the right movie at the right period in what we're covering, and it is so fucking spectacular. Uh, and I'll never get over the fucking Labrador running around with the William Shatner mask nope. on, man. That's so that fucking face, creepy. And I didn't know what that face was to believe it or not i thought it was like a plaster face not a plaster face but maybe like a mold face of duncan's head yeah they might have been trying for that because shatner does have some of the same facial features as yeah. what duncan does they have very similar bone structure and, and everything. maybe that's why the hair is all messed up because duncan's hair it's a little more wide like yeah like maybe they tried to make it curly and they just they also yeah. changed the mask up a little bit but it's horrifying but either way it. it's fucking when, when i first saw it i went holy shit i hope that's not in the lot in this movie because that's just <laughs> <laughs> that that's un that's unnerving. <laughs> yeah, they used it just enough too to worry about it doesn't become parody and silly, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it, an excellent fucking movie. I highly recommend it. It's Kino Lorber is the release studio, so you should be able to find it on their website. Even stuff that seems like it's out of print or not available everywhere else, like Amazon, you can get it on Kino Lorber's site. I say that because there's a movie coming up that I didn't know existed that I found the trailer for on this disc that uh-huh. that I purchased, and that'll be next year. Nice. <laughs> that'll be we'll we'll be watching it next year, and hopefully. I'll remember that I said that and I'll bring it up whenever we cover it. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. 
All right, so we've got a little bit longer of an episode. We can at least squeeze in a little PSYOP news before we go, so let's do that. Let's do it. All right, yeah. we're going to take a little break here. We'll play the Geek Radio Daily promo. We'll have a little bit of music that doesn't really fit with the movie but is royalty-free, so suck it, don't steal copyright. <laughs> yeah. And when we come back, we'll do some PSYOP news. Are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery? Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? To answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a Sweekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. sing along for this one everybody knows you should not steal copyright otherwise they're gonna fuck up your shows and make you cut them all down to shit and it just ain't fucking worth it so just give me some psyop news all right this comes from uh robert man on the street there that's our man robert our field reporter yes naked man driving stolen jso cruiser crashes into woods on i-10 uh and this is uh, uh i'll give you one guess as to what state this florida is. you can't pay a bail you goddamn well, right probably fix that for a blowy jacksonville florida a naked man driving stolen jacksonville sheriff's officer's cruiser crashed in the woods just off interstate 10 on thursday the as the a police. news <laughs> as a news for jack's crew watched the incident unfold so they just pretty much got to film this, this i'm gonna stop gotta think, all my guns because cops don't help you you gotta think they're watching this and they're like oh, jesus christ this is the best <laughs> yeah. they're all like, the cops are bumbling I mean, dummies <laughs> they gotta be like this has to be the best film we're gonna get all fucking year there's no way it gets better than this <laughs> Uh, you can't pay a bail? Well, I could probably fix that for a blowy. News for Jack's reporter Joe McLean watched the crash that happened off of I-10 near the 348 mile marker just before noon. America is a bunch of cunts. According to the GSO arrest report, the 22-year-old man was driving his roommate's car and got into a crash. A Jacksonville police officer found him around 11.30 a.m. lying naked in the road on I-10 near Chaffee Road. I'm already getting <laughs> arrested. I might as well grab this guy's dick. If you want to... Really check out this article. There's a video of the dude running around. I'm already getting arrested. Stopped. I might as well grab this guy's dick. The officer stopped to try and help the man whose news for Jack is not naming because of mental health concern. Police said the man at first complied with the officer, but then became combative and ran toward the officer's car and jumped.
jumped into the driver's seat. Dude finally Jesus. gets hard, so now it's time to plow. Well, that story Jesus. took a turn. Yeah, right? A GSO spokesperson said the officer's car door was closed, but not locked. Because it's super hot, you should be able to fuck one time. Roll well, it is Florida. Uh, the officer was wrestling with the naked man, trying to get him out of the driver's seat, according to GSO. But when the man started to drive away, the officer backed away because he was at risk of getting injured by the moving car. So we're going to be pushing the Christian agenda right down your fucking throat. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, the officer was clipped by the vehicle as it pulled away and suffered minor arm and back injuries, but wasn't admitted to the hospital. The naked man drove the JSO vehicle erratically and it crashed into trees a few minutes later. Man, the man is the worst hand job ever. <laughs> The man who appeared to be in, dis- in a distressed mental state leapt out of the driver's side window and started screaming. Does this make me gay? You, I, you might have screamed. I don't know. JSO officers were just seconds behind and arrived with weapons drawn and took the man to custody. The man was taken to the hospital as a precaution and is believed to be undergoing a psychiatric evaluation. I hooked up the, with a bad boy. I started doing drugs after that. God damn it. When did I say that? <laughs> I hooked up with a bad boy. That's a separate clip from this one. I started doing okay. drugs after that. All right. Nice. I nice. just play well them together because they work really well. I hooked they, up with a really bad does. boy. I started doing drugs after that. The man was charged with car theft, aggravated battery, and a police officer hit and run depriving an officer of his means of communication, the car radio, and resisting police. You can't pay your bail? So, well, I could probably fix that for a blowy. I'd rather not. Thank you. To hell with the police. Wow. I mean, I don't think that. <laughs> Literally just said that. Old cops are bumbling dummies. Well, okay, I do believe that. To yeah. hell with the police. <laughs> to hell with the police. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Ooh, is that me getting a metal rod shoved up my rectum? No, I don't want that. He must have an incredibly long penis. I do. I do. Thank you. Oh, Jesus. It's micro penis time. Before the show. <laughs> yeah, you're yawning your way through it because you don't give a fuck about people. So we got to end the show here. Well, I give a fuck and, about and, people. I'm sorry. We're out of time. We're going to go ahead and play the Ending Legion promo here. We're going to have a little bit of music that sort of fits in with the devil theme. And when we come back, we'll close out the show. You asshole. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
I was, that shit sounded nice for you. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I don't do black metal that well. I can't sound like a pissed off gremlin. I'm just no Danny Filth, dude. I just I don't got it. It's you just, just do di- regular death metal? Yeah, I, I'm, that's the voice that I got is the death metal. I think I might just be a little too baritone. I'm how too does barrel your throat chested. not just die? There's a way to be able to do it to make it sound like it's much worse and how it's much more painful than it actually is. Oh. Yeah. I didn't have the prerequisite honey and uh, various other mixtures to do the, the gargly noise, sort of like Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't do it for very long. I, that, do, I, do, I do enjoy that idea that, you know, the death metal guys and he's back there and they look all badass, but he's like, you know, drinking honey for his throat. <laughs> like, all right, yeah, the, let's make sure everything's okay. Well, the black metal guy, but yeah, you if yeah. you want to take care of your throat, most black metal guys give zero fucks and they don't care what happens to them anyway, so they, they yeah. don't do that. If you want to have other instances where we've delayed closing out the show because I've tried to educate Matt on the differences between black metal and death metal, you can find that on the previous 284 <laughs> episodes of legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. That's where you're going to find it. That's our main landing and launching page. You can also join our Facebook group, which is Cinema Psyops. I'm available there. Matt sometimes shows up like kind of when he fucking feels like it and he's trying to waste time and not talk to his kid. Like then he'll sort of be there. Uh, I'm on Facebook as Court Psyops, and Matt, once again, is occasionally on Facebook Jesus, Jesus sometimes. Jesus, just to dime me out right there. <laughs> as Matt shit, Psyops. Like, in, like, multiple ways, you just fucking rolled me out. Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> you can email feedback to Matt and let him know that he's a horrible fucking person, psyopmatt at gmail.com. <laughs> Or you can email <laughs> feedback to court, let them know that it's not cool to just constantly bag on your friend, even though everything that you said is absolutely 100% true. CinemaSciencecourt hey. at gmail.com. Hey, 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 like 99.9% true, all right? Don't give yourself so much credit, shithead. You can tweet a couple of tweets on the hate-filled shitfest that has been transformed into a porn bot utopia that is Twitter. <laughs> I'm at uh, court underscore psyop, and he is at psyop Matt. And, and what a utopia it is. We're also available on Instagram for the show. That's where all of the memes that I steal get posted before being centered on to the Facebook group and various other spots. That is cinema underscore psyops. You can tap right to the source of that Instagram right there if you want. Yeah, all that gram of Insta. Now, Matt, I believe you had something very heartfelt and caring that you wanted to say to the sh- folks at home. I did? Yeah. But come on, man. You had this prepared, right? Well, what? Oh, I'm sorry, folks. We're out of time. Kick the fuck out of this weekend. Make it your bitch. Fuck you, Matt. I know, right? We live on planet fucking hot. Fuck Matt. I agree. I mean, that seems a little unnecessary. <laughs> I love how you just start going into bits. Like, you just, you're like, you answer the fucking phone. I just throw a couple things at you. You're just like, fuck it. I'll just start. I'll play off of whatever. I mean, I as well start now. What, I mean, what else are we going to do? <laughs> you know what you should start doing is recording on your side. I really should. And I am. One, two, three. That was a weak clap. <laughs> yeah, hold on, that was bad. One, two, three. <laughs> Fuck, man, I just yeah, helped just dig myself out of fucking a horrible nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> we're living in snow, maha. So, yeah, I mean, it's fucking ridiculous out there. Yeah, I'm Ugh. just going to wait till the morning. Fuck it. I got 24 hours from when the snow stops falling, and that's yeah. not going to be till 3 in the morning. So if I do it in the morning, it's fine. I just do it because I'm like, fuck, I'll get fucking, I'll kill myself with, with as much as what's going on with my knee and my lower back right now. So I'm just like, I might as well just keep fucking going. I bought like this chintzy little electric snowblower. It, it, it Ooh, takes, that's nice. It takes a couple passes, but it, it does the job. Yeah, you know? that's still better than a fucking shovel. That's what I'm using. Yeah, yeah. And I got like a couple like uh, other um, plow like shovels, like those man plow things. I don't know if you've heard of those. But yeah. I bought one of those and uh, I'm pretty happy with that. It's just that you can't pick up snow for shit. So I'm, I'm going to try a combination of the two. But nobody cares about any of that. And we're 
We're, we're no. wasting time. We need to get this show going. I'm still going to make a joke that we're broadcasting from Hoth. Oh, yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, this is just going to show up in the outtakes because that's just what I do. I, we, I use yeah. literally everything. <laughs> 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 All right, so you're good to go on your on your side? Uh, you're recording. Yep. Your waveform looks good? Yep, everything looks good. All right, and you obviously heard my clips, so let's get this going. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to scratch him behind his hind ears the entire time. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, he's fucking adorable. Yeah. Um, you know, you can kill me anytime, puppers. So, anyway. <laughs> Ooh, danger pets. Oh, who's a danger puppy? Are you a danger puppy? <laughs> um, fuck, that made me lose my place. <laughs> I don't know, man. It, 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 I get this kind of feeling that they got, they had some sort of arrangement, if you will. You just um, have a hard time picturing fucking Hawkeye in a committed relationship where he wouldn't have cheated on her. Yeah, and I, and I feel bad. It's Hawkeye. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing, man? You can't do this to Hawkeye. Just because it's fucking Hawkeye's, the actor who plays Hawkeye doesn't mean the character is going to automatically be a swinger, dude. No, uh, no, that's true. But anyway, I still think they were. Um, <laughs> you can believe what you want to believe, man. I ain't gonna tell you how to interpret this deal. film. I just don't. I just don't agree with you. All right. this prepared right well what oh, i'm sorry folks we're out of time kick the fuck out of this weekend make it your bitch sorry i didn't, I didn't follow you on that one <laughs> <laughs> no it's better that you didn't i'll almost all have right. to take this shit out now that we talked about it so or you can leave it in because we really don't give a flying fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah people will go along with the ride anyway they have yeah, so I mean, our fans understand <laughs> <laughs> and scare us a little yeah right yeah oh my god all right i've stopped recording on my side